Welcome to Osiradok Ukrainian Cultural and Educational Center's lecture, Interpreting and Reinterpreting the Pisimka, a conversation with Sofika Zalik, artist and ethnographer. Dating back thousands of years, the Pisimka is an art form with deep cultural roots. In the modern day, the Pisimka is also a medium for innovation, creativity, and cultural expression. We are delighted that you are able to join us this evening for this lecture, exploring the history, symbolism, and traditions of Pisanka writing, and for a conversation with Sufika about her own adaptation of the art form. This event will take place in English with the opportunity to ask questions in either English or Ukrainian. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Marta Natyu. Для тих, котрі не знайомі з осередком української культури і освіти, ми є різноманітна організація тут в центрі Вінніпегу. Осередок – це музей, картинна галерея, архів і бібліотека. Осередок також є громадський культурний центр, в котрому проводимо заход, різні заходи, курси та культурні програми. For those who are unfamiliar, with Osirado Ukrainian Cultural and Educational Center, we are a multifaceted organization located in the heart of Winnipeg. Osirado serves as a museum, art gallery, archives, library, as well as a community center and cultural hub. Programming at Osirado involves various workshops, educational courses, and events like tonight's lecture. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to our guest, Sofika Zielik. Sofika Zielik is a Ukrainian artist from New York who specializes in traditional Ukrainian art forms, including pisanke and ceramics. She holds a degree in art history from New York University. Throughout her career, she has lectured and exhibited her works around the world, including in Ukraine, where she was the first American of Ukrainian descent to exhibit work in their ancestral homeland, in the Taras Shevchenko Museum in Kanyev, Taras Shevchenko Museum in Kiev. In 1995, Sofika Zielik was inducted to the prestigious Association of For Folk Artists of Ukraine. From 2014 to 2015, she was a Fulbright scholar in Kiev, Ukraine, researching folk art as the inspiration and the muse for 20th century artists of Ukraine. Her piss and ke are in the permanent collections of the Ukrainian Museum in New York, the Ukrainian Museum and Library in Stamford, Connecticut, the Embassy of Ukraine in Washington, D.C., American House in Kiev, and Pisanka Museum in Kolomea, in Kolomea, Ukraine. They can also be found in numerous private collections worldwide. In early 1993, she published a bilingual book, The Art of the Pisanka in Ukraine. It contains 100 color photographs of her eggs, as well as sections on the lore of Ukrainian Easter eggs and step-by-step -step instructions. Welcome, Sofiko. Thank you very much, Pani Marto. Uh, before I actually start my presentation, I would just like to say that Alexandra from the Osaredo contacted me about, oh, this was late, January, early February, and we decided upon a date and everything for this presentation. And then uh, February 24th happened. And I, like probably everybody here, went through a series of emotions. First, it was shock, disbelief, then it was utter sadness, and then it was real anger. And Alexandra reached out to me again in my anger stage and asked me, because of the circumstances, do I want to postpone this lecture? And since I was in my anger stage, I of course said, absolutely not. Had she contacted me just a bit earlier, I would have said yes, that we should postpone it. And I think that would have been a very big mistake because at this time, cultural diplomacy is extremely important. Um, every one of us fights now with the weapon, so to speak, that they are most familiar with. And my weapon is Pisanka and cultural diplomacy. So I do want to thank Alexandra for reaching out to me exactly that day and not a day earlier when I was still in shock and disbelief and anything else and everything else. And now I will start the program. 
the Pisanka. Every people of the world had the way of explaining the origins of the world. Uh, they created myths and legends, and one of the most prevalent is that in the beginning, there was nothing except a woman slash bird who laid an egg. The top part of the egg became the sky, the bottom half became the earth, and the yolk became the sun. Now, there are different variations of this myth. Some say that the egg membrane became the water or the egg, egg whites became the clouds, but basically everything sprang from an egg and the egg was revered. And our ancestors revered the egg as well. Our ancestors in Ukraine lived in harmony with nature. They lived according to nature's rhythm and everything that they couldn't explain, they explained by the power of nature or the spirits of nature. And eventually these spirits were personified and created pagan gods. Now, in the winter time, the days grow shorter. People didn't know why this was happening. They thought that the sun god was leaving them. So to bring him back, they gave him an egg as a gift. But they didn't just give a plain egg. They decorated it with signs of tribute to the gods, as well as prayers in the hopes that the sun god would grant them the wishes. But before I get back to that, they chose an egg as a gift for the sun for three very important reasons. Number one, birds fly high in the air. They're much closer to the sun than people are. By holding the egg in one's hand, people thought that they could harness a little bit of the power of the sun. Number two, the yolk in the sun reminds the people of the sun itself. And what better way to pay tribute to somebody than with his image? And number three, the most important reason of all, very often a rooster comes out of a chicken egg and the sun god only listened to the rooster because when the rooster crows, the sun comes out. Now, one of the earliest symbols of the sun god whose name was Dajboch in the pagan uh, pantheon is the eight pointed star. But there are many symbols. Uh, for example, this is again an A-pointed star. Here, I hope you can see my arrow as I'm pointing, is a very, I mean, you could see that this is the sun. The swastika in the middle, it has a very bad reputation now, but it's the old Sanskrit symbol for good luck, and it symbolized the, the movement of the sun across the sky. The three-spoke solar wheel, and a cross equal on all four sides represented the powerful Dajboch. The second god, or should I say goddess is in, in importance, is the female earth goddess, the Berehenya or Mokosh. She was the protector of the family, the protector of everything that's good. Even some historians claim that she was the protector of childbirth. And she is shown in a variety of ways, but with one, two, three, or three pairs of arms always up. She is asking for rain. And sometimes she's hidden in the design. You can tell that the pisanka on the right is a berehenya or the pisanka on the left, and also the pisanka on the bottom, which is just the head and the arms. But the pisanka all the way on the bottom is the tree of life and the berehenya is hidden. You can see the little head and the arms on the edge of each branch. The third god, which I really like, is Veles. He was the god of cattle. Therefore, cattle equates to wealth at that time. And he was also the god of music, art, and poetry. And this god had a big eye on his forehead. His symbol 
is a circle with one, two, or three bands around it. And he would look with that eye into fields, forests, and farms to see that animals were being reborn after a long winter. And his symbol, if you know how to look for it, is all over designs in many eggs. The first eggs were just, the first pisenke, I should say, were just randomly placed symbols. It wasn't important that the lines were straight or that the colors came out beautifully. It was important that the sun god knew what you were writing on them. And this is a very old design from the Kharkiv region of Ukraine. This is a rooster. And when the rooster crows, the sun comes out. On the bottom, there is the Berehenia with her arms outstretched. And this is also the introduction of the god of vegetation. And a pine branch is a symbol of health and eternal life because the pine branch never dies. Now, Pisanke, way back when, were only written by women and only in the dead of night so no one could see what you were doing because then they could cast an evil eye on the design and the sun god would not grant them the wish. So very often the design was hidden. It wasn't really realistic. As in these three eggs, this design is the rooster. But I don't know if anybody would really know it's a rooster except for the rooster combs here. And this is a combination of the swastika, which shows the movement of the sun and the rooster's comb. And these two are representations of the rooster. Oh, the horse. The horse was extremely important in our mythology. You see, the sun god had a son and he was a horse. And it was the horse's job to take his father across the sky from east to west, just like Greek mythology. So this was, there was a very important cult to the horse in Ukraine. And I personally have never seen a traditional Pisanka design without the symbol of the sun by the horse. And you can see in each square by a horse, there are little symbols of the sun. Another animal which was very important is the deer. It's symbolic of strength and prosperity. And there's a legend that says that one day, the god of the underworld, the evil god of the underworld, kidnapped the sun and darkness engulfed the world. The only creature that was brave enough to rescue the sun was the deer. He went to the underworld and brought out the lightness, the sun, on his antlers. And he is also on the pesanke with the sun symbols. In this case, the band of the crosses equal on all four sides. Birds, they were symbolic of happiness and the harbingers of spring. Chicks, chicks mean fertility. Now this egg, I already told the story a few times, but I will repeat it. About, I would say 15 years ago, a friend of mine really wanted to have children and it just didn't happen. And one year I gave her exactly this egg, the one I took a picture with. This has many, many chicks on it. She called me 10 months later saying, not only did she have a baby, she had twins. Now, I don't know if I'm the reason and the egg is the reason for this, but of course it could not. It, it could not hurt. Flowers are symbolic of happiness. And the meander. The meander is very difficult to do. There's a common misconception that very intricate geometric designs are very difficult. No, they're time consuming, but basically they're straight lines. But to do a round swirl or, or a round circle on an oval egg is very difficult. 
And these meanders have no beginning or no end. All the lines go into each other. They symbolize eternity. And the legend says that if an evil spirit enters your home, he'll become trapped in these lines, but he will never be able to find the end because there is no end. It symbolizes eternity. So the evil spirit will be there forever and your home will be evil spirit free. The 48 triangles. This is a design in various variations throughout Ukraine. They're called the 40 triangles, but the design is actually made up of 48 triangles. Uh, with each triangle, one made, one got a special wish from the sun god. And the three angles in the triangle represent earth, air, or fire, or the magic three of life, birth, and death, or actually I should say birth, life, and death. Children died, infants died, and they only had birth and death. So to have a long life, the triangle represents that. There are also very many rules on who to give what kind of egg as a gift. A white egg or an egg with a lot of white was given to a child or a young person because their life was like a blank page, not yet written on. Whereas an older person would get a design that is very geometrically uh, complex or something with a lot of dark colors because their page has been written on. Again, a young girl should get something with flowers because it's happiness. A boy would get a rooster, a deer, or a uh, horse because it's strength and masculinity. A sick person would get a pine branch because it's health and everlasting life. And so on and so on and so on. And something very important happened. Anybody who ever went to Ukrainian school knows the date 988 AD. That is when the ruler of Kiev in Rus, Volodymyr Veliki, accepted Christianity for his people. He wanted them no longer to uh, worship many gods, but to become Christian. Well, there's a problem with that. Paganism was so rooted in people's lives that they couldn't become Christian overnight, in a week, in a year, in a decade, or even in a century. The Catholic church, I'm sorry, the Christian church, there was no Catholic church then. The Christian church went to war, but they lost at every turn. And what happened is that people continued with their pagan traditions while they slowly started with their Christian traditions. And eventually the two merged. And if you think about it, we can even talk about this in the Q&A, all, almost all of our religious tradition, cultural traditions have their roots in paganism. And pisanke are no different. The fish, once a sign of good harvest, became the sign, the sign of the growing church. The 48 triangles, which I said are called the 40 triangles, will now make sense. 40 is very easy to explain in the Christian religion. The 40 days of Lent, 40 days Christ spent in the desert, and 40 martyrs. And of course, the triangle itself started to represent the Holy Trinity. The Berehenia, or Mokosh, who was the most important female, the goddess in our pagan pantheon, became the most important female in the Christian religion. And if, if you ever go to the capital city of Kiyu, which I hope we all can in the near future, please go to the St. Sophia Church and you will see an absolutely gorgeous mosaic from Yaroslav Mudri's time where the Virgin Mary has her hands, arms outstretched just like the Berehenia. And even the sun symbol, cross, equal on all four signs, 
eventually transformed into the Christian cross. The only symbol that I know that is new that was added during the Christian times of uh, this tradition is the church. Now this, yes, accidents do happen. You can't do anything about them. And it's usually the peasant kid that came out really nicely. It's never the ones that didn't come out. And if you remember the slide that I showed just before, it is exa exactly the same egg, the church. It came out beautifully, I loved it, but then, well, accidents happen. But I included this slide because I wanted to really emphasize that traditionally the egg has to be intact. A pisanka cannot be blown out. It has power, the yolk has power. If you blow out the inside, the yolk, you can no longer harness the power of the sun. It is no longer rebirth. It is no longer the sun. That, whether it's the son of God or the sun in the sky, depending on paganism or Christianity. But the yoke has to be inside. And that's what people believe. The yoke was sacred. There are also many legends as to why people make pisanka. My favorite pagan legend says that someplace in the Carpathian mountains, there's an evil monster chained up to a cave. Each year he sends his spies into the world to see if people are making pisanke. If people are making pisanke, the spies come back and tighten the chains. But if this, this tradition is no longer kept up, the spies don't return to the cave the chains become looser and looser. Eventually the monster will come out and it will be the end of the world. So people thought they had to create Pesanke in order the, for the world to exist. My favorite Christian legend says that before Christ uh, carried the cross all the way to his place of cruci crucifixion, one of the onlookers, Simon, helped him. But before Simon could do so, he put down a basket of eggs that he was carrying to the marketplace. Now, upon returning from his good deed, the eggs, the eggshells, turned a bright red color as a reward. Simon was so startled by this that he dropped the basket and the eggs rolled down the hill and rested by the Virgin Mary, who was praying at her son's cross. As she prayed, she cried and the tears rolled down her cheeks onto the eggs, creating beautiful designs. And this legend also explains why the earliest designs were always on a red background. Uh, the pagan reason is that red was the color of the sun god. And I think the practical reason was because red was an easier color to do than, for example, black. For many pisanka are natural dyes from roots, berries, uh, blueberries. I heard not uh, even from nuts, which is which is very interesting. The recipes for the dyes in olden times were passed down in secret from mother to daughter, as I said, only women were allowed to create eggs. But these pisanke were also used for every, everyday life. They were not meant to be long lasting. During the Easter season, there was always a big bowl of pisanke in the house. And whenever somebody left the house for whatever reason, they took an egg with them to protect against evil. Egg shells were ground and put into cattle feed so that the cattle would be healthy. The eggs were buried in, in the garden so that the harvest would be better. Eternity eggs with eternity designs would be put in beehives so that you would have continuous honey 
which was extremely important uh, a long time ago. Um, when a, a pisanka was added to the collector life, and when a house was being built, pisanka were put on all four corners so that your home would be evil spirit free. And there are so many other uses for eggs, even the rag that you use to dry the egg after each dye was used to cure certain diseases. Some of the dyes were made out of medicinal herbs. So what people did when somebody was sick with certain diseases, they would burn the rag with the colors, color stains on them, and the sick people would inhale the fumes and that would cure them. Now, Ukraine is a large country, as everybody knows, and each region had their own specific type of design and color scheme for eggs, just like embroidery. If somebody studies embroidery, you can automatically tell the difference between borshchu, uh, pudila, sorochka, which the whole sleeve is embroidered in a lot of black as opposed to the Carpathian mountain region where embroidery is usually yellow, orange, and red. Well, the same thing with Pisanka. The only uh, mistake in this, in this map is that there's a Pisanka in the Crimean Peninsula. Crimean Tatars are the indigenous inhabitants of the Crimean Peninsula. And of course, the Greeks towards, towards the south of, of the peninsula. But the Crimean Tatars did not create Pesanke. But you can tell uh, where the Pesanke are from by just looking at the design. These five eggs are from the Kursk region of Ukraine. Uh, they're, they are from the village of Kozatska Sloboda. Of course, Kursk is now in the Russian Federation. But not so long ago, it was part of Ukraine. And you can see that the designs are different, but quite similar. And it's very easy to pick them out out of a crowd. These three eggs are from the KU region. When I say KU region, I don't mean exactly the city of KU. If, you, if I can compare it to something that's in the US, it would be there is the city of New York, and then there is the state of New York. So by region, I mean the state of New York. But these three eggs are from the KU region, but we can actually pinpoint the village. It is the village of Holubyatin, and you can see they're quite similar. These are eggs from two, two different areas in the Pidlasha area, which is from the east. The slide on top is, is from Politbilsk, and the slide on the bottom is from the Rohochin. Everybody, or almost everybody now, assumes that the most traditional and the best pisanke are the very geometric, complex Hutsul designs. They are absolutely beautiful, but these are not the only pisanke we have. You'd be very surprised to know that the three eggs on the bottom part of the screen are also from the Hutsu area. It's just that they are not known as much as the very intricate geometric ones. And even Hutsu Pisanke had blue in them, which a lot of people don't know. And of course, when I talked about embroidery and borshchu, which has embroidery that's very dark, you can see that the pisanke complement the embroidery because these are four pisanke from the borshchu area in the pugila area. I have clients very often coming to me and asking to see the most traditional pisanke with the most traditional design and the most traditional color. And I try to explain to them that there, there is no such thing. There is no most traditional design or color. And then when I show them these eggs, they absolutely do not believe me. They think I made it up. But no, 
These are very traditional designs, white, pink, and green, from Eastern Pordilla, from the region of Surja. So you can have a very traditional design from a certain area or from a certain village, but there's no such thing as one of the most traditional pisanke. Now, everything that I have shown you up until now are traditional, and I'm putting that in quotes, and we can actually talk about that in the Q&A. But all of this, this whole tradition was passed down orally from mother to daughter. Up until about the 1850s, that's when something happened known as the Spring of Nations. It was basically a revolution that happened all throughout Europe when people started looking for their roots, when people started to, well, create their nations. And the same thing happened in Ukraine, but it was also a time where folklorists, ethnographers, historians started looking at peasants and peasant art, folk art, as not something to be, oh, frowned upon and something, oh, peasant, no they started looking at, at it as something beautiful. And they went into the fields and documented their research. And they have many books from the oh late 1800s up until I would say the beginning of World War II and when uh, Ukraine was absorbed by the Soviet Union. And that's when all the field work stopped because any religious uh, study was not permitted at that point. But also in the late 1800s, early 1900s, up until, well, now actually, uh, Ukrainians started to emigrate, whether it was an emigration which was economic or a poli political one as my parents and grandparents. But these immigrants or refugees, depending on the situation, brought with them their traditions, including Pesanke, and continued them in their adopted homelands. But in time, they forgot why they were doing this. And the emphasis on the Pesanke tradition was no longer on symbolism and prayers to the sun god and, and everything like that. The emphasis now was on the perfection of the design and on the intricacy of the design. And this is just one of the postcards that was sold in a very famous Surma bookstore that was uh, started by one of the immigrants in the early 1900s. And you can see that these eggs are absolutely beautiful but they're not the same as those quote unquote traditional eggs. They lack that. And I can't to this day find out, can figure out the word of what they lack. They are beautiful, but they don't have that, that something. And these are known as diaspora pesanke. And they were done in the US, in Canada, in South America, in Australia, in, in Europe, in every country that there was Ukrainian immigration. And these are three of examples of my diaspora pesanke. They're very different from the other ones. Now, right now, I just want to quickly go through some traditional and diaspora designs that I really, really like. This one is from the Hutsu area, and it is called the Krivulka. Roughly translated, it's the curly one. And this particular design has seven hoops. Three, of course, an uneven number was magical, but any other, because it was birth, life, and death, but any other uneven number was also magical. And this egg, a woman would give to her husband if she suspected and I'm gonna say this very politely, if she suspected that perhaps he was looking in a different direction. Now, if this was actually the case, during the night, the hoops were supposed to come off the egg, come onto the husband, tie him up, and therefore he would be faithful. And 
I sell many of these eggs. The bees, this is a diaspora design. There is a Christian legend that says when Christ was on the cross, he wanted something to drink, but the soldiers wouldn't give him anything. The bees heard this, flew by and placed honey on his lips so Christ would have a sweet taste. And they're uh, immortalized on the pisanke with their symbol. This, I hope some of you can recognize, is the symbol of the Berehenya, the earth goddess. We have the large triangle here, which is her body. We have a star here, which is the head. And we have the leaves and these curly cues, with our, which are the arms. But if you look closer, the head is the star. The star is the symbol of the sun. One pair of arms is the oak tree, the oak leaf. And the oak leaf was the symbol of strength as well as the symbol of the main god, Perun, which was the equivalent of Zeus. So in this design, we have basically three gods rolled into one. Oh, in this design. This, yes, can be Veles, the god with one eye. However, because there are little rays coming out of the circles, this is the sun. For the longest time, I had no idea what this triangle was until I found out. This is a symbol of the eclipse. This is a documented eclipse. This is a design, a traditional one from the Chernihu area. There must have been eclipse. That eclipse then, it scared the people half to death. And this is, in my opinion, a historical document. And this is a throwback to the Berehenya. The Berehenya in time, in Christianity, became, well, a Christian symbol. She became in one egg, this is an egg that is called Cholovik, but I think it's mankind translated. This is a woman and you have a cross here. And this is a man, which I believe is a priest. And of course, one arm is raised, just like the Berehenya asking for rain. But the best part about this is the priest has an umbrella. So this is a throwback to the Berehenya, which is one of my favorite designs. And this is a very interesting egg. Um, very often, People attributed names to the designs, not because that's actually what it meant, but because someplace along the line, people thought, well, that looks like a sunflower. So I'll call this egg sunflower. And that's how it was passed down. Very often, uh, designs that look like flowers have the names of rabbit ears, duck's feet, crow's necks, and so forth. This particular design, which looks like a flower, is called Vochi Zube, the wolf's teeth. And yes, it's very possible that this design was to protect against attacks of wolves. However, the ethnographer Mikhailo Skorik, which was the father of the composer Miroslav Skorik, had a theory that all these designs, which have uh, rabbit's ears and duck's necks that look like flowers were actually the names of medicinal herbs. And he found out that certain medicine women in certain parts of Ukraine called dandelions, which we know have many medicinal purposes, they called them bochizube, wolves teeth. So I'm inclined to really agree with uh, Professor Skorik's hypothesis. The only time that the Pesanka was ever blown out was in two areas of Ukraine, the Hutsul region in the West and the Boyki region in the West. The egg was, had holes on two sides for the wings and people would put in paper wings and a tail and in the Hutsul region, the beak was made out of wax, but in the Boiko region where my mother is from, uh, the beaks were made out of paper as well. And these eggs 
were hung at Easter time, but to commemorate something that happened at Christmas. When Jesus was born, the Holy Spirit came to him in shape of a dove. And these, they're called holupti, not holupti, which is stuffed cabbage, but holupti would be hung from beams in a home in the Carpathians and in the Boiko region. And they're quite beautiful. Now, up until now, we talked about diaspora eggs as well as traditional eggs. And now we come to the third interpretation. This is not a pisanka. This is something I call egg art. For anyone who had children or grandchildren in the past 25 to 30 years, they know what Thomas the Tank Engine is. It is a series of stories and cartoons and movies about different train engines. And there are George and Thomas and, and uh, Duncan and Percy, and uh, there are about 50 of them. But my nephew, who turned 25 just two days ago, well, when he was four or five, he loved Thomas. And one year, when he was four, I created a design of Thomas. Now you can see that Luca, my nephew, has kept this pisanka, no, I shouldn't say that, egg, in the sun and the colors have faded. However, I must say that he loved this egg. He put it in his basket to be blessed and I have never seen so many four and five-year-old boys around his basket looking at this egg. And this was the beginning of my creating what is known as autorski pisanke. Basically, it's translated as the author's pisanke, or as I keep on saying, the author's eggs, egg art. I also paint ceramics, and this is a close up of a ceramic design that I, well, there was a traditional KU ceramic design that I interpreted onto uh, a plate. Then I took that interpreted ceramic design and I put that on a goose egg. And this is my interpretation of an interpretation of and a traditional KU motif on a goose egg. And this is the same uh, interpretation, but on an ostrich egg. And I can tell you that ostrich uh, eggs were not found in Ukraine. This is not traditional. This is just uh, the imagination of the, of the people of the 20th century. This is my ceramic plate based on Hutzul designs. They use this color scheme and uh, they painted everyday life figures. This is a wedding. You see the dancing couple, the married couple, and the orchestra. I created a 10 series goose egg series called the Hutzel Wedding. And here I am showing you just four of the goose eggs. Here on the right, upper right, we have the newlywed couple. Right next to that, we have the Svacha which carries the korobai, the wedding bread. On the bottom, we have the two musicians. The rest of the series has more musicians, the wedding guests who are toasting the couple, drinking, enjoying themselves, and of course, the Hutzel church in the background. I also do uh, icons on eggs, and this, I drew inspiration from embroidery. In Ukraine, there is white on white embroidery. Uh, the cross stitch is what most people know, but the cross stitch actually came very light, very uh, late into the Ukrainian embroidery tradition. There are many different techniques. And I base this on the Mereshka and Verizuvanya, which is uh, lace and Verizuvanya is cut out. And instead of white on white, I did white on black. And this, by the way, is 
the largest goose egg you can get. It is a Canadian double yolk jumbo goose egg. It's very hard to, to buy this type of egg because most of these jumbo goose look like sausages, little kobaske. They're long and thin. So if anybody knows of a source for these jumbo W Canadian goose eggs, please let me know. I would be, <coughs> excuse me, I would be very grateful. And this egg is a, is a regular goose egg. I went to see a Picasso exhibit and I didn't realize what influence the exhibit had on me until I melted off the wax of the egg I was doing. And I realized that this came out. You know, when you're making a pisanka or egg art, you have the design in your head and you think you know what it's going to come out, how it's going to come out, but it's always a surprise. It's sometimes better, it's sometimes worse, but it's always a surprise. Now, about 12 years ago, I went to an exhibit of the Ukrainian-born artist Sonia Delaney. Sonia Delaney was born in the Poltava area. As a very young girl, she moved to St. Petersburg, but uh, spent most of her life in Paris. She, with her husband, Robert Delaney, created a new uh, art school that was called Orphism, and it is just round swirls, round circles. She was the first living woman to have an exhibit at the Louvre while, while she was alive. And in all her memoirs, in all her biographies and autobiographies, she says that her biggest news from beginning to end was Ukrainian folk art specifically, folk art and folklore of weddings. And you can imagine a wedding in the Poltava area where the bride has all the ribbons and the wreaths and the plach and the korovais and, and the everything. And, and this is my interpretation of Sonia Delaney's artistic style. Now, as I said before, geometric designs are straight lines. It takes very long, but it's not as difficult as swirls and circles. This was extremely hard to do. But I really, I'm, I'm very critical of my work, but I like the way this turns out. And few people know that Sonia Delaney was also a textile and fashion designer. She had her ateliers in the Netherlands and in France, in Paris. And this is my interpretation of her textiles. When I went to exhibit at the exhibit that I mentioned earlier, I saw a plachta, a vishuka, a, a pisanka design in every one of her creations. And I also did an icon in the style of Sonia Delaney. This is the head of Mary. This is the head of the child. And this is the body of the child. And this is a goose egg. Maria Primachenko, naive artist, born in Ukraine has received much publicity lately because uh, the Russian troops destroyed a museum that housed her work in Ukraine. But luckily the villagers saved most of the work. When I was living in KU on my Fulbright grant, I saw many of Maria Primachenko's works. She did everyday scenes, she, she did scenes of nature, but she also did mythical beasts. And those are what I liked best. And these are my egg designs of Primachenko's mythical beasts. We see the elephants, the elephant right here. I love the way that she always put on hats on her beasts. Uh, this is another hat here. We have serpents, we have birds, we have all kinds of beasts. And sunflowers are now in the news as well. So these are Maria Primachenko's sunflowers. And um, as I mentioned before, I went through these stages of grief when the war started. And uh, the day that Alexandra reached out to me if I would like to continue with this lecture, I was so angry, it wasn't even anger, it, it, it was rage, that I sat down 
and created this egg. And this is a monster with his jaw wide open, his teeth coming out, dripping with blood, and hydra-like tongues devouring everything in its sight. And on the other side of the egg, I did the peaceful sunflowers. And I hope that very soon I can turn over the beast and just look at the sunflowers. And Kazimir Malevich. Kazimir Malevich was born in Kiev. He is the father of suprematism. He is the author of The Black Square, which I'm sure everybody knows, but Kazimir Malevich painted in many, many styles. With this series, I concentrated mostly on the type of art he produced while living in, during his KU period, he taught at the academy there from 1928 to 1930. And this is the series of those eggs, as well as his suprematism eggs. And he writes also in all his memoirs that his muse was folk art and uh, the painting, the Petrikiuka paintings, the Easter egg paintings, the embroidery. In his very young days, he went to villages and helped them paint, especially the outside of their houses. And that was his muse. And I also, up to, uh, to my knowledge, um, either Delaunay or Malevich never painted icons, but I did an icon in the Malevich style of his KU period, as well as in the suprematist style. And I incorporated the black square. This is the Virgin Mary and she's holding the baby Jesus. Now, how do we make pisanke? I'm sure everybody knows, but just to review, these are the stages that one egg has to go through to become the finished product. The materials are a white egg, a candle, beeswax, and a stylus, a copper funnel attached to a stick. We use beeswax because that is the only type of wax that turns dark when it's heated in a copper funnel. Now you heat the stylus with the wax inside in the candle flame, and you wax the areas you want to be white on the white shell. So the black lines right over here is the wax. The wax protects, it seals the, the everything, the color that it, uh, that it covers. So that when you dip the egg into the yellow dye, the shell changes, but not the parts of the, of the egg under the wax. And then on the yellow shell, you wax all the areas you want to be yellow in the design. You dip the egg into the next dye. In this case, it is red. You, you can't tell this is red from the picture, but this is actually a red egg. And you wax all the areas that you want to be red in your design. And then you dip the egg into the last color in this, uh, the darkest last color. In this case, it's black. When you take out the egg, everything, the wax is black and the eggshell is black. Then you put the egg by the candle flame, slowly section by section, you melt the wax, being very careful not to burn your fingers because you automatically drop the egg. And well, that's the end of that. You wipe the egg off, and a pisanka is born. Now, I wish there were shortcuts. I wish I could tell you some easy ways to create a pisanka, but there are none. Everything from the simplest design to the ostrich egg I showed you, to the autorski pisanke of Delaney Malevich, uh, uh, Premachenko, uh, the ones I'm working on now, were all done exactly in the traditional batik technique. Now, usually I end my lecture with this photograph. I took about 75 traditional eggs to a farm and I put them by chickens. 
And the chickens were very excited by this. And I took pictures and I usually end my talk by saying, oh, I wish it was that easy. But today under the circumstances, I would like to end with this picture. And I have a request for all the members of the audience. A few days ago, I started a Pisanka project. As I said in the beginning, my weapon during this time is the Pisanka. And I mention the traditional pagan design that says, as long as people are creating Easter eggs, the monster chained up in the cave will not get loose and will not, there will not be a destruction of the world. Now the monster is evil personified. I don't use any names because I think once you start using names, that person gets more power. So let's just leave it as evil personified. But I am requesting that anybody who wants to, whether you're an artist, whether you're a regular person, a, a child, I am, I am inviting kids to join, create a traditionally designed pisanka, not a made up design, nothing, anything, but a traditional designed pisanka because this is a traditional legend. And I would ask them to send this pisanka. The only thing I must add is we ask that it is an eggshell. So that is the only untraditional part of this project. And that is mostly for, well, reasons you can understand. It's impossible to send a real full egg from Canada to the US for, or from anywhere else for that matter. And there would be very, very many accidents. So I am requesting a traditionally designed pisanka eggshell that you can send to the Ukrainian Institute of America because I am doing this in partnership with the Ukrainian Institute as well as SFUJO, World Federation of Ukrainian Women's Organizations. As I said before, only women were allowed to do these eggs, but we're allowing men to do this too at this point. And since SPUJO is a women's organization, it makes perfect sense. And I'm asking Austin to put the address of the Ukrainian Institute of America into the chat. So you can send one traditional pisanka. It will be an art installation, a living art installation, because it will change every day as more eggs come in. And hopefully with this power, of the ancients, of the sun god, of everything we have, we can have evil personified relinquished. So anyway, thank you. I hope I haven't uh, kept you too long. I would be happy to answer any questions and I hope to see many pisanki in the mail coming to the Ukrainian Institute of America. I thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, cool. Ooh, where's the first question? Some eggs looked like the white lines were over top of the other colors. For example, white lines over red and green circles. How did you do that? It's exact, okay. when you take a white egg and you make a line with the wax, it stays white. So that way, if you dip the egg into, let's say the red dye, and then you wax a circle over that line, the part under the wax will be white because the wax sealed the color. It's a very simple process, but it's, a, you know, this, when I, when I talk to children about this, when I talk to children about this, uh, I say, imagine taking your index finger and putting a rubber band really tightly around it. Put your finger with the rubber band in yellow paint. 
take it out, everything is yellow, and then put another rubber band a little lower, and then put your finger in red paint. So take off the, uh, the rubber bands and you will have a section of white, a section of red, and the section that is black or whatever other color. I'm trying to explain this, but I don't know if I did correctly. Okay. I hope I did. Okay, thank you. I'm uh, moving on. Is there a due date for the Pisanka project? No, there isn't. It will be started by the end of the weekend. But as I said, as eggs come in, the project will be forever changing. This will be not, if I can just say, this will be not beautifully placed eggs that you can see. This will be a mountain of eggs because together, I believe we are strength. So we are not singling out any artist, any person. And if also I might add, because the eggshells themselves had magical properties, when the time comes, the eggshells will be transported back to Ukraina with the help, with, with rebuilding. They will be also put into uh, the ground so the harvest would be there. They would be put in symbolically into houses for the rebirth of a nation. Okay, thank you. Next question. Is there any example of pussy willows in the symbolism? Pussy willows are a new addition. They, they are very prevalent in the, in the West uh, and uh, they are usually put by the cross. So they do exist, but they are not the old traditional traditional. They could be, right now people associate them with a pine branch. So yes, they're here, they're a Christian symbol, but it's, it's newer, I would say it's the 20th century. Okay. Okay. Um, there are many comments thanking you, Safika. Um, will this recording be available to watch again? I don't know if you can answer that or Osteredo can. I think Osteredo. Okay, so we'll have to refer to someone else. Thank you. Very many comments of thank you for wonderful presentation. Oh, the recording will be of this lecture will be made available on Osteredo's YouTube later this week. Okay, any other questions? Where can we buy tools to make our own eggs? I'm completely new to this. Okay, uh, in Winnipeg, I can answer that. Exactly. At Osiradok, <laughs> of course, at uh, Osiradok Ukrainian Cultural and Educational Center, also at Kalina Bookstore. These are two places that I know of. Uh, maybe Osiradok can put the addresses up. Uh, you know, okay. I believe that any church hall would have it. I know you can buy them from Toronto and they ship. Right. There is, I believe, accessories, they sh egg, egg accessories USA. Right. They ship and if you want to buy egg shells, uh, it, you can buy them through Etsy. You can oh. buy four, Thank 12 you. egg shells for this project. But the, I the must blown say, out. if you're doing, yes, blown out eggs. If you're doing eggs for yourself to be blessed at Easter time, I would recommend doing an egg that is full. If you're doing an egg for this project, don't forget it has two holes on either side for the, the yolk was drained out. So you have to seal the holes with the hot wax. And then when you put the egg into the dye, since it's not full, it floats on top. So you'll have to uh -huh. keep it down with a spoon. That's why I tell everybody, do a full egg if it's just for yourself. Okay, someone says, I've never, uh, Jordy, never blown out an egg any tips. And then how best to mail them safely. So first of all, ah, tips on okay. blowing out an egg. Tips on blowing out an egg. You can get an egg blower. I have purchased some from the Minneapolis gift shop in the US, but I believe other, uh, other stores have them. You can also, if you do, I would recommend that you can also take a nail and make a hole very gently on either side and a bigger hole, not, not a tiny one. And you can actually, once you varnish the egg, you have to varnish the egg first. Uh, 
Okay, let me start it this way. If you're working on an egg that has already been blown out for this project, you do not have to varnish it. If you're working on a full egg and would like to be a participant in this project, you have to varnish it first, let it dry, and then you blow out the inside. You make two holes on either side of the egg and you can pump air with, it's called an egg blower, I think, uh, through one hole and the yolk comes out from another hole, or you can make larger holes and, uh, and blow out the inside with your air. That's also possible. As, okay, and please and remember, uh, I'm sorry, that this project, it doesn't matter if your lines are straight or not. It's the symbolism that counts. Uh, same question, what's the protocol for safely shipping oh. uh, the eggs? What's the best way to mail them? You know what I do? I buy little Tupperwares. I buy, but good, sturdy Tupperwares. I wrap the eggs in tissues in a way that the egg does not move in the Tupperware. Then I buy a little bit bigger box and put it, it newspaper or, or those peanuts and also make sure that the Tupperware does not move. And I then send it. I have never had an accident sending it this way. You can also use a coffee can. You can use a small coffee can and put tissue paper and tissues so that the egg does not move and put the coffee can into a box and send it. Someone is asking, what do the different colors represent that they have might have missed this information? Um, the colors, the symbols are more important than the colors, but the colors do have uh, some meaning. White is purity. Red is the color of the sun god and color of joy. I just found out recently that pisanke that are black and white were done for the souls of the departed. So uh, some ethnographers say that green is the color of rebirth, but it all depends. You know, if I can say that I've heard many talks on pisanke and some people say, well, exactly, this means that. These eggs started in the Paleolithic era. This, this happened, this and this. We don't actually know. And we can't say for certain. This is what we suspect. So, um, so with the colors, this is what we think. But a lot of people, depending on your sources, make up their own information. So you have to be careful on what you read and which sources you have. How do you ensure that an egg that is blown, uh, not blown out does not go rotten? Oh, you know. Like a full egg. Yeah. With the yolk. You have to, yeah. You have to inspect the egg before you start with it that it doesn't have any cracks. Once it's varnished, it can last for years, do not keep it in the sun. And if you're going away on vacation during uh, summer, put it in the refrigerator. But eventually the inside hard, the yolk hardens and then the yolk, the, it's like a little marble and then it turns into dust. So within, I would say five, 10 years, you will just have the eggshell because the inside would have already turned to dust. Okay, thank you. Uh, someone has posted that Ukrainian egg accessories is in Toronto and ships everywhere. Oh, um, okay, uh, should you allow the eggs to be brought to room temperature before starting? Yes, I always do that because if they're cold, you have hot wax and the wax might not uh, attach itself to the cold shell. So they should be room temperature, yes. Okay, so Saradok has just posted their address uh, for, and they do have Pisanka supplies, including Kiska's dyes, everything. Um, and there's an online store posted. Uh, also, what else do we have? Suggestions for varnish. What would you suggest? Um, you know, I'm still experimenting with varnish. Uh, every time I find something I like, it's discontinued. Uh, 
But uh, what you can do if you're just doing one egg, especially for this project, you can buy clear nail polish. And uh, with the little brush, or even with a larger brush, uh, cover one side of the egg, let it dry, turn it to the other side. But otherwise, I would suggest buy any kind of oil-based varnish or polyurethane, not water-based. It has to be oil-based. And if it's non-yellowing, that's even better. Okay. Uh, could you comment on etched eggs? No, <laughs> because I've <laughs> never done them. I know many people, especially in Ukraine, do, and they're quite beautiful. It's done with acid, as I understand, but I have never tried to do them, no. Okay, do finger oils ruin the eggs? Mm, no, you just have to wash your hands. That's all I would say. Don't put on any kind of moisturizer before you start making right. a pisanka. I think that that is all the questions we have for tonight. Uh, I don't know if Austin is around to answer my question. Uh, I don't see any more new questions. Many, many complimentary comments. Thanking you for oh, such a you. wonderful presentation. Um, yes, excellent information. Very interesting. Thanks so much. Uh, so, I'm reading them uh, right now. Yes. You're reading them. OK, good. Yes. I hope I didn't miss any questions. Oh, oh you know, five. there is one about the swastika which is okay. as you said, a very controversial here there it is right yes. how did the sanskrit um, swastika become part of the traditional, traditional pattern pattern migration migration back and forth and back and forth and uh the swastikas is it well before was known throughout the world as a symbol for good luck so it is on the eggs and uh and that's what it is. <laughs> Very. Yeah. It's, thank you from Buenos Aires, from Argentina. Uh, oh. A post from Osirada that they will be having an etched pisanka uh, workshop on April 9th. So if anyone is interested. I am, I, actually. <laughs> it's a little I've, far, seen them, but... I've seen them done. We've done them with uh, people do them with vinegar, using vinegar instead of the, the actual acid. Ah. Okay, it's looking forward. Okay. I th think that wraps it up for the questions. Austin or Alexandra, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Is that it for the questions? If I missed anything? And again, a comment. Thank you for sharing your artistry with us. Thank you. And thank you very much for the Osteraduk. It was my, oh, can I just add one more thing really quickly? When I was looking at the Osereduk website, you have a section called the spotlight or, or something to that effect. And what I found there was, I think, a treasure that you have. There was an egg, I'm not gonna call it a pisanka, of Tetyana Kosic. And she was the wife of, of course, Alexander Kosic, who was uh, the conductor of the choir the Koshitz Choir, and we in New York this year are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Koshitz Choir singing Shedrick at Carnegie Hall. Wow. But what I'm getting at is that um, she produced a egg and she wrote the name of, uh, she wrote the words to a Vesnyanka, which or a Hahilka, which is a spring song. So I think Tatyana Kosic was ahead of her time because nobody was doing this. I believe this was the 50s. Right. Everybody, they were diaspora pisanke, which were very intricate designs. But I believe without knowing it, she was a trendsetter. And she did, from what I remember, I can no longer find it on the website, she did white lettering on a black background. So I would love wow. to come to the Osteradok and see the archives because from what I see, you have treasures in that building. Yes, there are there are many hundreds, I don't know the exact number of Pisanke in our in the collection at Osteradok. Okay. I would love um, to see that. 
once the world settles down. Well, once it settles down, we'll, we will welcome you. Thank you. Yaku you share us. And yeah, yeah. if there, okay. So Austin, do we sign off now? Yeah, I'll be ending the meeting right away. Sophita, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. It was, I learned so much just from- My pleasure. Yeah, it was just amazing. And we will be so happy to have you at Osorado when you're able to uh, to come down and then when things settle down a bit. Believe me, it's it, it's the, the thing, be careful what you wish for. I might never leave. From what <laughs> I understand, that is in the archives. <laughs> All right. But and, thank uh, you very much. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. Dobranić. 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 Dobranić.